before we get started, I'll uh, share a quick background about SKIM and who we are. We're a customer insights agency uh, specialized in decision behavior, and we have offices in Europe, the U.S., Latin America, and Asia. SKIM has been the global pricing partner for many multinational companies. Uh, so we can help you define your pricing and portfolio strategy and address price and portfolio management questions. Um, and with our thorough understanding of the pricing challenges that you face every day, we deliver actionable results during interactive pricing workshops and trainings. Uh, so today you're actually going to be getting a taste of what those workshops are like in a very condensed version because normally we do this in an entire day. Um, so we're very happy to have you with us and thank you all for attending. Uh, should you have any questions, just pop them into the question bar on GoToWebinar, and we'll be able to answer them at the end, or if we run out of time, I'll, uh, uh, John will get back to you by email. So I'm now going to hand over the floor to John. Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, so I also want to start by saying that um, we have actually conducted a lot of pricing studies in the past years. So as Abby said, we scheme has been on for open for like 35 years now. And in the past five years alone, we have conducted about 200 pricing studies in many countries across around 500 brands in 45 different categories. It's, it's quite a large number, and because of this, we get to learn a lot about pricing in general. And disregarding the different category effects, we have a lot of learnings from that, and that's what we want to share with you today. Um, so what we will be talking about today is um, three different topics. We'll first talk about pricing management in the organization, uh, and as well as uh, different stakeholders and what their priorities are. We will also talk about how do you actually see and judge your pricing value in the market before even we talk about pricing research, just how to judge it. And finally, and that's the bulk of the presentation, we'll be talking about different pricing research methods and uh, what different problems you solve. and. Um, and that's it. I hope uh, you enjoy the presentation. So first of all, we'll be talking about pricing management. And before I do that, I want to say why pricing itself is important. I mean, it's a question kind of is, um, is a bit, it's a bit in, in marketing. And why do you want to see why do we say that is if you look at the four p's of marketing that's product promotion price and place price is really the only p of them that actually gives you money everything else is a cost factor and um, in mckinsey's analysis the uh, determined that pricing is the most important factor to uh, drive your profits and it has a 10 to 1 ratio in its impact compared to the next most important factor in driving profits, that's the variable costs. And that's that's why we talk about pricing, that's why we put so much importance about pricing, because it's the single most important determinant of how much revenue and profit you will be getting. All right, so now we'll start to talk about pricing management. And by pricing management, what we mean is how do you actually, how do organizations set their price? And there are three uh, different approaches um, that are most common and we'll talk about each one in detail. So the first one is cost plus, and that's basically um, you, you know your product cost, you add a margin to that, and then that's how you set your price. Finance team really loves that approach because it always ensures there's some profit. Um, second approach is market-based, and that's you look at your competitors and you decide on the prices accordingly. So you don't really look at what your consumers want, you don't really look at what your costs are, you just decide on it based on, competit on competition. And that makes it um, very easy for sales teams or account management teams to be able to compare directly your product against competition. Finally, um, the third approach is value-based approach in determining prices. And that's based entirely on the customers. How much are they actually willing to buy for your product? It, of course, ignores cost. It can ignore competition, also not very much so. We'll talk about that. And marketing, of course, really likes that because it's the most uh, consumer-friendly approach. Look at the cost, and you add a fixed factor to that. 
It could be a relative or an absolute factor, for example, 20% higher, that's my profit margin, or two euros higher, or two dollars higher. Um, it is the oldest approach, it's most popular, most new companies and small to medium sized companies work with that approach. Um, it's objective, it's uh, very easy to understand from a financial point of view, however, it's really only internally focused. It doesn't look at what the customer wants, it doesn't look at the competition, um, and over time, as you, as an organization, do more innovation in your cost-saving techniques and in your marketing techniques, it becomes a bit more um, chaotic, this cost-plus approach, because your costs can lower over time, but you're not necessarily going to be lowering your price over time as well. And if a competition does something else, you're not ready to respond to it because you are just depending on cost alone. So cost price, cost plus approach, while it is the most popular, it's really the most uh, introvert approach, so to say. The second approach is market-based, and that's a bit of a step better. And what it does is it looks at the competition and it makes sure that um, the price of your product is competitive enough to take into account this landscape. This approach is not very sustainable because it's, um, it's all about lowering price um, and it's commonly applied in commodities. So that's always what you see, for example, in steel industries and oil industries and so on. Um, it doesn't consider differences from competition. It's usually applied where there is no differentiation really in this category and um, it ignores the com consumer perception. It usually leads to kind of a, a flat line of pricing across the category if a category follows this approach. Finally, the third type is value-based pricing and value-based pricing is basically driven by how much customers or consumers want to buy for your product and how much customers want to buy for, for your product depends on two main things, or three main things. How much budget does he have? What your competitors are asking for in terms of price, so your price relative to competition. And finally, how much value does he actually see in your product? Based on all of this, that determines your customer value. However, perhaps the customer value approach uh, doesn't uh, coincide very well with your cost. Perhaps the value is a bit low, so you, you would be losing money, so that doesn't really work out very well. And that's, that's what you see here, is that each one of these approaches looks at one or two metrics and ignores everything else. So naturally, what we really recommend, of course, is you take everything into account. You take your consumer into account, you take your competition into account, you take your costs into account when you manage your price. That gets quite complicated pretty quickly. It is essential, but it gets, it gets very complicated, which is why there's quite a number of uh, stakeholders now that are involved in pricing decision. Each one of the stakeholders has different priorities. For example, marketing teams, you want to make sure the volume share is higher. Uh, the sales team or account management, you want to make sure you have a good relationship with the distributors, let's say supermarkets, for example, and that their product is in a, has a good shelf real estate in the supermarket. And so that's a different priority. Another priority, of course, is the finance, to make sure there's good profit margins, there's good cash flow over time to allow for innovation. Um, and finally, you have uh, product management stakeholders, which is most focused on which features are most enticing for consumers and wanting to do continuous innovation and continuous upgrades for the product portfolio. So each one of those stakeholders, they're all working together, but they all have uh, different, usually conflicting objectives uh, at what you want out of the price of the product. Um, and what that leads to is um, a decision-making process that can look as complex as this. You start with the consumer, with the competition, with the customer, and based on all of this, you define an objective, and this is objective relating to pricing, for example, you start making sure that uh, financial analysis makes sense, the value makes sense to the consumer, and after all of this, after everybody agrees, then we start moving to communication and implementation. And after all of that, you still, if you're, for example, working consumer goods, you still have to convince the retailer of that price. So this is all a first step. Of course, it will be tested for real once the retailer agrees on this price and the consumer actually is willing to buy for this price. Um, but the process is very difficult because 
everybody has uh, conflicting objectives. However, there is really no escape of this process because it, um, it's essential to be competitive, to be profitable, and to have a good value in front of your consumer. So the value concepts is what we will be talking about most here in this presentation because from a research point of view, we are most interested in knowing what the customers want and what the customers want is basically what drives the product value. So we will look deeper into this. But first, I want to move to the second section, which is how to evaluate how good your price is, just in a very basic way, without doing any extensive pricing research or any extensive regression analysis or whatever, how do you know how good your price is, just in a simple way. And here what you, I'll introduce an, a very simple approach called price value mapping. Price value mapping basically helps you do three things. Uh, see how your consumers perceive different products in the category you operate in. Uh, it helps explain and sometimes also predict how your market share will move up or down. It doesn't tell you how much it will actually increase, but it will tell you what direction it will increase or decrease. And uh, it also gives you a quick view on how competitive you are in the marketplace. So let's see what this all means. First of all, we'll talk about, we'll talk about each one of these uh, independently with an example. So first thing is, uh, to understand how your consumers perceive the products. And basically what this means is that you need to measure how what the value is of your product and then you plot that against price. So you end up with a simple chart, which we'll show in the next slide, where you have price against value and you draw a line and you basically see where your product falls on that line. Right? Um, but to do that, first you need to be able to calculate what your consumer value is, how much do consumers value your product compared to competition. How do you do that? Most companies have regular trackers of um, brand equity or, and or satisfaction surveys where you usually have a purchase intent question or a consumer value question as well as how satisfied consumers are with different attributes that relate to the category. So let's look here for example at a restaurant example. Uh, so there's different restaurants here from ranging from fast food to brasserie all the way to a Michelin star. And you have different attributes that the restaurant is being evaluated on. Your food quality, sophistication, location. And each of these are attributes you would be testing already in your brand equity research or satisfaction research. And of course, usually in terms of uh, in comparison to competition as well. And then you see how much does each one of the competitors, including yourself, score in each of these attributes. And after that, you apply a weight to be able to merge all these numbers together. The weight should be related to how important these attributes are in driving consumer choice. That's also a piece of uh, information you usually get from your research. And finally, you end up with a total value score for each one of these types of restaurants. And we also know what the average price um, it's for each of these restaurants. You just look at the menu and figure it out. You plot everything together. You have here on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we have the perceived product value. We have on the vertical axis as a price. Um, we plot each type of restaurant and we draw a line, a regression line, and that's what's called the value equivalence line. Um, so this value equivalence line tells its value to price ratio that a consumer expects in this category. So this relates to expectations. It doesn't relate to uh, what they actually see. What they actually see are the dots. So the line relates to expectation. All right, so again, what, what does that mean? Um, it, how does it help me to be able to plot that? So first thing it helps you with is that it explains as a market share evolution. So basically, you're able to compare the products and see if you are higher or lower than the value equivalence line as compared to competition. If you're comparing lower, you are generally going to be consistently losing share if you don't do anything. And if you're performing higher, you'll be consistently gaining share if your competition is not doing anything. So let's see how that looks like. So here, for example, we have the Michelin star and luxury restaurants. They are too overpriced compared to the average value value equivalence line. 
because those restaurants are better priced compared to the values they are perceived, uh, um, which means that over time it's likely that the mission star and luxury restaurants will start losing share just because the value consumers perceive from them does not match the price you are asking for. All right. So again, what other uses can we uh, use this value equivalence line in? What if, ha what, uh, what if, for example, suddenly a lot of the restaurants start increasing their price because of a supply chain issue? Then you have the fast food, brasserie, bistro, increasing their prices, which that means that the expectation of price compared to value is increasing now. So the consumers are expecting to pay more just because they see everything is increasing the price. So your value as a luxury or mission star restaurant starts to increase, relatively speaking, just because the line is going up. All right. So these are all different ways you can kind of quickly judge the category. All right. So now, let's say you are lower than the value equivalence line should be. What what do you do about it? So what happens is, let's say you are this luxury restaurant and you want to be able to match the value equivalence line, which means you want to be able to match the price that you're asking for. So there are a few things you can do. You can lower your price, you can increase your value, or you can do a mix of both. Sounds straightforward. Um, usually, lowering price is a bad idea because once you lower your price, you're making your consumers more conscious of the price you're paying, and subsequently, you usually increase the price sensitivity of your own consumers. Never a thing you want to do unless you absolutely have to. Um, what's better is you start increasing the value to match the price you're asking for. And for that, you start looking at all the scores that you had on the different aspects of your restaurant. It could be the chef is not doing very well, the consumers don't feel that he's creative enough, for example, or the decor is not very good or, or compared to what they expect from a luxury restaurant. And you start looking at these things and you improve the value. So, that is what you're consuming. In terms of also the competition. Okay, so now we will talk about uh, measure of um, how strong your price is or how strong your value is. It requires it requires a bit of pricing research. So we'll talk a bit about um, price elasticity, what it is, and in the pricing research we'll say how how it's actually being measured. So price elasticity is actually quite simple. What it does is it says, as you change your price, how much will your market share change? Straightforward. If I increase my price, I expect that my market share will go down. If I decrease my price, I expect that my market share will go up. How much will it go up if I increase my price by 10 euro, or how much will it go down if I decrease it by 5 euro? Uh, that's what this curve will tell us. So how steep this curve is, um, if there are any breaks in the curve, this is what tells us um, how much higher or lower demand we expect as we change the price. And this allows you to be able to do scenarios. So basically, if you know the value is a price elasticity curve, um, you're able to make some simulations and see if I decrease this price here, this is how much share I will get, this is how much revenue extra I will get, how much does this compare to my cost, and so on. So you're able to make some scenarios if you know this curve and be able to judge which price points you should price on. So that's kind of the primary value for prices. Let's look at some of the properties of it. So start with something simple. Um, there can be a high price, high pr your product can have a high price sensitivity or it can have a low price sensitivity. We usually say high or low at an arbitrary value of a slope of one. Slope of one means if you increase your price by 10%, your share will lower by 10% relatively. So it's basically a one-to-one -one ratio. 
so we just use that as a baseline to be able to judge. It doesn't exactly mean that no price sensitivity, uh, like my less than one is always lower, less than higher than one is always high. It's not always like this, but uh, one is an easy way to just start judging a curve. And a high price sensitivity usually means that your product is fragile. It means that consumers are primarily buying it because of the price. And if you decide to increase the price by any little bit, you will start losing a lot of your consumers. Not a good place to be, but it happens. And low price sensitivity, on the other hand, it means that your product is more resilient. It means that as you increase the prices, you are actually not losing a lot of, uh, a lot of consumers. But it also means that if you lower the price, you're not really getting a lot more consumers. So something to bear in mind. This means that in a high price sensitivity situation, it's always easier, doesn't mean it's best, but it's always easier to lower your price if you want to gain a bit more revenue. And if you have low price sensitivity, it's actually recommended and it's, it's good to increase your price and then you'll be able to get a bit more revenue as well. All right, so the charts I showed earlier were fake lines. This is how a real price sensitivity uh, chart would look like. What we have here on the vertical axis, that's the volume index. What it, this is how we usually look at price, is you have uh, the current base case volume of the product, uh, how it is current, how much share it currently has, and we just look how much extra volume or less volume you get as you increase or decrease the price. There's a few properties we see here in this chart. First thing we see is that the curve does not look the same throughout the price spectrum. Sometimes it's steep, sometimes it's flat, and it changes over time, and there are different reasons for that we'll be talking about. Another thing we see here where the white line is, is that there's a sharp decrease in share as you cross the $40 or 40 euro price point. And that's, that correlates to what we call a psychological price points. So if consumers are used to paying uh, you 30 something in that product, if you move between 35 and 37, it's gonna be not as much noticeable as you move from 37 to 41. Once you start hitting psychological price points, we start seeing a sharp price, a sharp share decrease. There are other uh, factors that cause also a sharp share decrease other than psychological price points. Uh, it's what we call reference price. And it's basically, if the price is a bit higher than, what, uh, than a certain reference price in the consumer's head, you see also a sharp decrease in share. But what's the reference price? What is it based on? A reference price is usually based on uh, the historical price as you are used to pay, or um, the average of competition, for example, or also um, what you expect to pay. So basically, this reference price is that since somewhere in the consumer's head determines at some at which point they start stopping, they stop to buy your product, and that's usually dependent on a lot of history and a lot of expectations in the consumer head. That's something we're able to see, of course, when we run a price study like this. Um, and we're, all, we're usually able to explain where these sharp drops happen. So usually a psychological price point, or you are bypassing the price points that a lot of competitors are on. OK, so something else. Now we showed you a price elasticity curve. Um, this curve does not always look the same. So let's assume this was one SQ, one product. Uh, if you are changing the prices of other products as well, the, the sensitivity of that first product will be different. That's because there's always interaction in the market. So this means that uh, the price sensitivity you are changing the price products of one of the Let's start purchasing the four
switching. other options and, and that's why the price sensitivity is not a fact it's not a one number it's a number relative to what else is happening in the market all right so now we talked a bit about the more uh, theoretical things so the value equivalence line price management and um, price sensitivity now we'll talk a bit about pricing research methods so how do you actually determine what this price elasticity is to start to be able to do some simulations and optimizations for your portfolio. So there are two, two basic types of uh, pricing research methods, rear view and forward looking. Rear view basically means you have previous data of uh, things that happen in the market, price changes, promotions, and so on, and you know what the market share was, and based on that you do some modeling, and you, um, based on that you can determine what you want to do in the future. Forward-looking is basically based on pricing research, so you ask certain questions to some respondents, and based on that, you are able to determine uh, what's the best approach to move on in the future. Um, we'll obviously talk about both, um, review in, a, in brief and forward-looking in more detail, because that's what we know best, most about. So, rear view is um, basically the three main types of rear view modeling. And first one is market mix modeling, that's the most common. And that's market mix modeling is basically you have a lot of data from, uh, let's say, supermarket or uh, any retailer, and you basically know each day or each week what price each product was, whether they were on promotion or not, um, and whether there was any advertisement, what the shelf uh, position was, and so on. And then you also know how much you sold in that week. And based on that, you are able to do quite some modeling. Um, however, it requires a lot of data, usually at least two years um, of weekly data because you need a lot of granularity. That's because a lot of things usually happen at the same time. And this market mix modeling is very good at determining whether a certain marketing activity you did paid off or not. So you spent X million euros on this big ad TV advertising campaign and you want to see what the return on investment was. Market mix models are very good at determining that. So you see how much you sold before, how much you sold after. You make a model to be able to isolate the different effects to see how much that advertising campaign alone did. And then you are able to see if it was worth it or not. Um, so market mix modeling is very good at that to be able to determine all these ROI things for promotions, features, distribution, so on. Um, it can also be used to calculate price sensitivity if there were some price variations for one product over the past couple of years. You're able to kind of see uh, how the share responded to these changes in price, and then you're able to make a, a basic price elasticity line out of it. However, usually in market mix models based on past data, uh, you are able to only get one price elasticity figure, basically one line for each product or for each brand. And that kind of contradicts with what we were saying earlier is that a product can have different price sensitivities depending on which price point it's in. We didn't see a flat line earlier. We saw a broken line and we saw um, psychological price points and we saw reference price points. So that's kind of a, um, a drawback of uh, market mix modeling is that it's um, it does not account for all these uh, subtle price variations and it can only really see, it can only measure the effect within the prices that actually happened in the past two years. 
So if you want to increase your price, let's say, by 10 or 15%, but that never happened in the past two years, you don't know what will happen uh, based on that model. So that's kind of the drawback at looking at price for market mix model. That's why we always say that market mix models are very good to determine return on investment, but not very good at looking in the future, especially when these actual prices did not happen in the past, of course, because then you're extrapolating. Um, and of, it always, of course, needs a lot of data, a lot of very granular data, which may be available in certain markets like US or the big European countries, only also from the big supermarkets, but in most other markets and channels, it's very difficult to get this granular level of data. All right, so now we will talk about uh, forward-looking research methodologies. So basically, uh, how do I determine price sensitivity? We'll talk about two techniques. We'll touch briefly on Van Vestendorp, because it's a small technique, and then conjoint analysis, which is our specialty here at SKIM. Uh, we'll talk about different ways we can use that to determine the price sensitivity and to do portfolio simulations. All right, so first, Van Vestendorp. Um, Van Vestendorp was actually um, a Dutch guy, and our chairman here at SCIM, Dirk, he actually worked with him back in the day. He, uh, Van Vestendorp introduced uh, this price meter in 1976, and it basically allows the respondents to tell you different price points that, are relate, that um, relate to how much they value the product you're showing them. And what it gives you eventually is kind of an optimal price range to price your product in. Uh, it assumes that respondents are, are capable of envisioning how much you would be willing to pay. It assumes a very rational approach. So how it works is you basically uh, show a product profile, a product description for uh, what you want to launch, and you just say at what price you consider this product to be cheap, at what price do you consider it to be expensive, but you'd still buy it? To what price do you consider it so cheap that you doubt its quality and so expensive that you'd never buy it? So you ask, ask each respondent these four price points. And after the analysis, some count analysis, you come up with a chart like this. And basically, you have something called IPPs, that's the indifference price point. You have OPPs, that's optimal price point. So that's kind of an ideal price point that um, maximizes demand. And you have the PMC to PME, these are, this is kind of your price range that's ideal to play with. Um, so this method is relatively straightforward, very easy to ask. However, it, um, it's very difficult to equate it with how much share you will get. It doesn't really predict very well um, what, what share you will get, because also you never really test the competition. You, uh, it's very conscious. Yes, it's very cognitive. You are asking specifically the respondent what price would you want to pay for this, which is rarely a good approach. Sometimes it works well. We see that this approach works very well when you're launching a new, very innovative product where there's really almost no competition exists. That rarely happens, but we do it a lot, especially in uh, big, innovative uh, healthcare devices in hospitals. Uh, this technique works very well for this type of thing. Um, however, in most categories where you're actually comparing, like where there's actually a competitive landscape and the consumer has a choice, not just you or nothing, it is not really the right approach. So what we will talk about next is um, conjoint analysis. Um, so conjoint analysis is techniques that has been around for a very long time, since the 70s or so, or a bit more before that as well. And it's... Um, basically an approach that simulates a competitive market and allows you to know, based on any variations that happens in the market, how the market shares will respond. Okay. So, uh, conjoint analysis is based on uh, something what we call discrete choice modeling. Discrete choice basically means that you are choosing one item out of a set. So that's what discrete choice is. We, um, it, we use it a lot in uh, consumer choice studies. And what the primary output of a conjoint analysis study, uh, we'll talk about all of this in detail, but here is just sharing a summary. Um, it gives you something that's called a utility, like the economic utility. And it gives you the utility for each respondent you have in your study for each possible feature of your product. So for example, if you're launching a 
a new phone, it tells you what is the utility for the respondent for different brands, for different screen sizes, for different uh, megapixels for the camera, uh, for the battery life, and so on. So for every possible variation of your product features, it can tell you uh, the utility as in the intrinsic value the respondent puts for this feature. That includes the price. And uh, the price, of course, has a negative value because it counteracts everything else. So you usually get negative utilities for price. Um, and basically, the total product choice depends on the composite of all these utilities combined, depending on what features you put. So if I'm going to choose 16 megapixels with Apple brand with um, two-day battery life at 300 or 400 euros, you add up the utilities of all these components, and you get a utility for the total product. And the discrete choice model implies that or assumes that the individual will choose the product with the highest total utility, meaning it provides them with the highest total value. Um, as I mentioned, price is usually one of these attributes that we test, which means we're able to, res to uh, simulate the response of these respondents to different price points. All right, so another thing uh, that's quite... Uh, good to know about is um, we get, we're able to get these utilities on the individual level. Traditionally, forecasting models, you do a study with 500 or 1,000 respondents, and then you get how will the total market respond. So you basically build a, a simulation model for your entire market at once, um, just because the older methods were this way. Now there are newer methods, like we use one, it's called hierarchical base, it's very good. And it allows us to also not only see these predictions for the entire market, but see it for each individual respondent. You ask me, all right, so what, what is the point of this? Why do we need to know it for each respondent? Because eventually you want to know the entire market. But this allows you to do very interesting things. You're able to make uh, behavioral segmentation. You're able to see which respondents respond to which features, which respondents are being driven in their choice by price versus brand versus certain types of features. You are able to easily uh, segment your respondents in any dimension you want, gender, social class, whatever. Uh, that's really the beauty of getting this. Eventually, product in the market. Share of prep. What translates eventually? is a, an old, much, older, much older approach to this called brand price trade-off where it would show something like this screen but then the next screen would be exactly the same except changing the price of one product then the third screen again you change the same price you change the same price of that product another time so it's very easy for the respondent to see what's happening and then they play a game with you in the survey which is not really what we want we want to know what drives your choice so because conjoint changes everything at the same time Every choice situation or every screen becomes a new choice situation, a new shopping trip, as we call it. And then, all right, I have all these new options in front of me. Which one do I like best? And we usually also ask, would you actually buy it or not, to be able to differentiate between liking best and whether you would actually buy the product or not. All right, so how does this help me in, in figuring out the price elasticity? That's what where we started all of this. So you 
show all these conjoint choice screens to the respondent. You collect all your respondents. You run the hierarchical base regression we talked about. You calculate the utilities, basically the, the propensity or the, the how much they like each of these attribute levels. Uh, how much do they drive their choice, basically. And then based on that, you're able to create a simulation model. Think of it as Legos or any, any toy where you put things together. The value of this utility is that you're able to simulate any scenario as long as it's within tested range. I'm able to simulate any camera configuration. Even if the respondent, even if respondent one never saw that exact configuration, we know how much they value each of its individual components, which is how we are able to make any simulation within the tested uh, environment. So, for example, we tested prices between 30 euros and 60 euros. We're able to simulate each and every product at this price range uh, for any other feature as well. And then see how these products stack up against each other, how much market share each one of them will get. So that's the basic overview of how conjoint works. And then if you start simulating the basic market, the current market, you usually get preference shares that really matches uh, the current market shares in the market. The conjoint is a very good method. It's quite validated in this regard. And then you see, OK, I'm going to change the price of product one from 3 euros to 5 euros. What will happen? So I just take the utility of 3 euros, throw it away, take the utility of 5 euros instead, see how much share will be. And uh, not only I see how much the share will be, I also will see where the share will come from, because I will see what other products will increase share in return. OK, so we said, of course, that uh, choice-based conjoint, that's what we call it. CB the CBC implies choice-based conjoint. It's, it's quite an intuitive method because it doesn't allow for respondent gaming. You're just seeing different uh, shops and you are choosing products. Uh, you don't only change the price, you can change other characteristics, like we mentioned. And this allows you to manage, your, manage an entire portfolio. So if you want to launch a series of products, each one with different sets of features, and the more the features, the more the price, you're able to optimize such an approach, uh, such a portfolio with a conjoint analysis approach. Um, it allows you to test different executions of price changes. So not just price, but how much does decreasing my pack size compare to how much to compare to increasing the price. Others, for you as a manufacturer, both are almost the same. For a consumer, however, you might be much more likely to notice a price change as compared to noticing a pack size change. So that allows you for alternatives to changing the price, which might also make your conversations with the retailer easier, because. Retailers don't really like uh, increasing prices very much, so you might want to decrease the size instead. That makes the conversation a bit easier. And of course, finally, uh, feature optimization. When you are, especially when you're launching a new product, and you want to figure out what price and what features to uh, include in that new product. This this is a technique to go for it. Um, so of course, it measures the price sensitivity, the brand sensitivity in a competitive market. Uh, as you see, it puts a very strong emphasis on competition and trade-off and what drivers of choice are. And then you're able to see the price interactions. If I increase the price and my competitor increase the price, what will happen? So this is the type of simulations you're able to do. What are the cannibalization effects? If I, if I decrease my price, uh, what am I getting share from? Am I getting share from my own products or am I getting share from the competition? That's cannibalization. is very important to know. Uh, and of course, to optimize what you are going to launch. All right, so now I want to talk about something a bit different, which is how do we actually show the experiment to the users? This is an example from a real study I've done for uh, an electronics uh, provider for computer mouse. There's a computer mouse stuff. So basically, uh, computer mouse as a piece of electronics, there's a lot of possible um, attributes that can describe it. So when we first did the study with our client, you see here on the left, we had a, a quite a sophisticated conjoint. We had a lot of attributes, like I, said, I can count around 12 here or so. Uh, you can see the brands on top, and then we are varying all the attributes. Respondents go through this one screen after the next, and then we calculate the share of different products. However, here the share of one of the products turned out to be 27%, which is really off when we compare to the real market shares. 
we had some discussions and then we realized we did actually, uh, we did a mistake and it doesn't make sense to show the choices like this. That's not how respondents choose. Respondents do not see all these attributes when they go to the electronic store. They see, as you see on the right, just packages of mouse. You see colors, you see uh, graphics, you see all these things, and you basically see the uh, brand, the price, and the most basic features on the front of the package. All this other information is still available, but it's in the back of the package. So what we did is we did it a very good shelf simulation. And uh, if you like put your mouse in the shelf on the picture, you're able to see all the extra characteristics. So what happened here is that most consumers don't care about these extra characteristics. They are just focused on brand, price, and whether, for example, it's wireless or not. And based on that, they will buy. However, some users are quite sophisticated and they want to know about all these other things. And these users would click on the picture and would see all these other attributes and would decide accordingly. Very similar to what happens in the store. What happens in the store is that if you want to know more, you have to grab the package, you have to look in the back, and you read the other characteristics and decide accordingly. And this really simulated the purchase process a lot better. What happened in the first one is that we were forcing all respondents, not only the technically savvy ones, to trade off between all these attributes that they don't even know what they mean. And that was very unrealistic. And when they see that one mouse is better than the other on some attribute, they start forcing their choices, um, which didn't lead to very good utilities because it does not simulate how, sorry, it does not emulate how uh, the products actually look in the shelf and how the decision process happens in the shelf. And this is very important because we, you cannot just um, make a model and assume respondents will choose the same. We have found from a lot of trial and error is that you have to make it as close as possible to the real choice situation um, to be able to get very good utilities. They used to say the 34% was much closer to the market reality than 27%. So this is what you see here, for example, this is how we usually do um, uh, shelf displays in consumer studies. So we try to things for the different SKUs. We also try to make sure that these shelf facings um, represent the ratio with which these products actually exist in the store. We even, we, you would even, if you are doing this test for multiple channels, you would even want to make sure that the products in the different channels actually relate to how the products are actually existing in the real channels and how they are displayed also. So if you're testing different channels that look differently, you need to make sure your experiment looks differently. It makes, it makes quite a big difference, and the closer you get to reality, the better your numbers will be. Um, another thing that I actually didn't talk about is uh, a good thing about conjoint is that it allows you to test prices that are um, outside the ranges that happened in the past. And that's kind of the advantage of um, conjoint over market mix modeling in this way, is that um, if, for example, you have never increased the price of your product plus 20% compared to now, uh, market modeling doesn't really allow you to know how much your share will reduce if you increase the price by 20%. Conjoint allows you to know that very well and also to know where the people who are going to leave you, where are they going to go. So uh, that's something very important. And so you're, it, um, it allows you to see um, scenarios that never happened. And that's, that's really, a, in my opinion, a very powerful tool. So a few tips if you're setting up your own pricing study or you're working with suppliers, a few things you need to know to make sure that the study um, is going to be as realistic as possible in its predictions. First of all, make sure you include the relevant competitive set. It sounds obvious, but it's missed a lot. Make sure uh, competitive set can mean different things. Let's take an example. Let's take beer. Um, if you are in a bar, the competitive set of beer is you have just a small selection of beers that's existent in that bar, and then you have other things. So you have sodas and you have liquors. If you go to a supermarket, the beer selection is different. It's more in, in crates, and you can also choose uh, soda, but you cannot choose liquor. If you go to a specialty beer store, you have a lot more variety in beer, but it's only beer. So that's what I mean. The competitive set 
not only varies uh, by category, but it also varies by channel. And depending on what you want to test, it's very important to keep that in mind. Who is actually taking market share from you? Uh, try to at least include 70% of the market who found that this kind of the minimum point uh, below that you, are, you start to miss a lot of interaction between the products. Usually we try to aim for at least 80%, but if that's too much products, sometimes some trade-offs have to be made. Also when you're showing the products on the shelf, you try to match the amount of shelf facings of that particular product as how they are in the, in the real store, in the real channel. Uh, to make sure it matches the reality a little bit. And of course, as we mentioned, use visuals and actual back shots to emulate the real process. Um, I'll talk about very briefly about two other techniques, and uh, we're almost done with our webinar. So there's another approach called menu-based conjoint, and that allows you to simulate a menu type of choices, and not just you have different options at different prices and you're choosing one, but you are composing your choice. You are saying, I'm going to have this burger with this cheese on top, with this type of fries on the side, with this soda on the side. You, this decision depends not only on the price of the burger, but on the price of all the individual components and on how much discount you get when you order the bundle together. So this type of complex decision process, it has a special technique called menu-based conjoint, and it's very good at simulating this type of restaurant environments as well as uh, uh, big devices. So for example, if you are buying a new big device, you want to know which features to include, which service contract levels to include, and sometimes you want to get bundles. Uh, you get bundles when you buy these big devices, especially in healthcare, and um, to determine whether respondents will go for individual features or to go for a bundle, menu based conjoint is, uh, is the way to go here. Um, so it works similarly, you basically instead of just choosing one from screens, we vary the prices, but every time the respondent builds what they are going to buy. So you say, I'm going to buy this with this with this. And for example, if there is a, a discount that happens with the bundle, we also show that, and then they are aware of it. And then we see how much this bundling effect really uh, drives their choice. It's a very powerful tool also in telecommunication. Because telecommunication, especially here in the Netherlands, a lot of bundling takes place. Another approach is called uh, adaptive choice-based conjoint, which is very similar to what we talked about in the beginning. It's just it's a choice between alternatives. However, if you have a lot of attributes, let's say you're buying a car, um, adaptive uh, choice-based conjoint allows you to determine first which attributes are relevant or not relevant in driving your choice, and then it builds the choice screens with only the attributes that are relevant to you so that the consumer is not overwhelmed by all these technical details. Okay, so what we learned so far. Um, so price elasticity acts as a compass and it guides your pricing activities and it also reflects how strong your brand equity is, how resilient you are to pricing changes. Market mix modeling is a very good tool to know the return on investment for um, different marketing activities, but it sometimes uh, lacks when you want to test some things that didn't happen before or when you want to know the exact uh, price sensitivity at different price points and how it breaks. It doesn't really show it very well. And as we mentioned, conjoint analysis allows for this market simulation, assuming you designed your experiment correctly, you included the relevant competitive set, you made the shopping experience as realistic as possible. It allows you to do what-if scenarios and predict market shares based on different um, scenarios. The so last slide I have uh, is something that's a relatively new application we are very excited about, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, it's basically using uh, also conjoint techniques for pricing of e-commerce subscriptions. So uh, let's see, like we have here um, Spotify, Netflix, and so on. Each one of these providers gives you a service offering with some features, and then you pay a price per month or price per year. Um, Usually, all these e-commerce providers do what we call A-B testing to determine how to optimize their website. So, so you put, for example, uh, red for 10% of the users and green for 90%, and if red worked well in terms of conversion rates, they just apply the red to all the 90, other 90%. So that's how they do iterative testing to improve the websites. However, this gets a little tricky with pricing because then you're showing two different prices for two different consumers, it's very difficult to track which consumers should which price, 
and for example here in the EU it's also there are a lot of regulations about pricing differentiation you're not really allowed in most cases to show two different prices for two different consumers uh, within the same market um, and most importantly if you're a big enough service this other price will be known it will be on the social media sphere and it may create un favorable effects that you didn't want before knowing whether this price is really the good way to go or not. So we also, that's what we do, we, um, similar to what we mentioned earlier about making the shelf as realistic as possible, you would build a replica of the website, make sure it's as realistic as possible for the consumers, and vary the package uh, uh, features, vary the price, and then see which package the respondents would go through. And that allows for a much lower risk for these e-commerce providers to price the services um, instead of uh, losing uh, losing market share or losing consumers because of trying to A-B test the price. So this is a safer way to do it. So it's just a new technique and this is going to be more, uh, it's scheme here, we're going to be doing another webinar about this specifically because it's a very exciting topic for us. Um, and um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. and. Uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we'll be sending around the slides and a recording of today's session afterward. You'll get that from me tomorrow. And uh, feel free to share it. And you can also visit skimgroup.com forward slash webinars uh, to sign up for our updates on our monthly webinars. On December 3rd, we're doing one on comparative claims, so adding value uh, to your product. Um, so yeah, on behalf of John and myself, thank you. And uh, should you have any questions, you know where to find us and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks.